Welcome everyone. I'm Brandon Staglin, and this is One Mind Brainwaves. Thank you so much for watching and participating with us today. How does the stress of financial adversity affect the mental health of young people in underserved communities? And what can be done to foster the kind of racial equity that leads to greater educational and economic opportunities within communities of color? We'll be exploring these ideas today with one of the nation's leading experts in racial disparities in mental health. We'll also be talking with a student leader who is working with her peers in Minneapolis to spread the word about mental wellness. And stick around later in the program, our team at One Mind Cyber Guide will be telling us about an app called Smiling Mind that aims to build uh, tools for young people to help them thrive throughout their lives. But first, his voice has been described as gravel on silk. It's soulful, emotive, beautiful, and soothing, surpassed only by its incredibly powerful and earnest storytelling. He's here today to perform a song for us that he rarely performs live. And we're incredibly grateful for, for being with us today. Here, hailing from Ontario, Canada, is singer and songwriter, I. I, thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to Brainwaves. Thanks for having me, I appreciate it. You bet, it's great to see you, thanks. So um, I, I, I learned a little bit about you and, and I heard your music, it's amazing. And I know that honesty is very important to you as a songwriter. Yes. And you've called yourself a conversationalist. What do you mean by that? Usually when I'm like performing, a lot of people perform, they do their whole set from beginning to end. It's just all songs, all music. And I like to go get on stage and tell stories and communicate with the audience. I think for me, um, the stories behind the songs and the stories that I create to tell about the songs, to talk about the songs are just as important to me as the songs themselves. And I'll go on stage sometimes and I'll talk for like seven minutes and the crowd is, it's, it's not, it's unheard of, I guess, but the crowd is still with me. You know what I mean? It's just, they'll, they'll stay with me and I'll, I'll be like, you guys want to hear more stories? And I'm like, you want to hear a long one or a short one? And they'll be like, give us the long one, right? So it's, it's it, I don't just go on stage and sing, you know what I mean? I could do a whole show of me just singing and performing and doing all, you know, band acrobatics. But I think storytelling is something we we don't do as much anymore in the music space. And it's a beautiful thing. Bill Withers is one of my favorite artists, one of the most honest, sincere artists. And when you listen to his live at Carnegie Hall, he's telling stories before every song. You know what I mean? And those stories just make the songs more powerful and more timeless, right? Absolutely. I love stories in music. And I'm just thinking yesterday how I miss how so much current music has moved away from the storytelling that was so that's been so prevalent in the past. That's my favorite kind of song. Um, are, are you drawn to art in all its forms for its sincerity? Yes. I, I, again, like back to honesty, like whenever people create from a space of vulnerability, that's the most beautiful thing to me. When you, you know, I always say create, or, you know, write, well, when I, when I do songwriting workshops and talk with, you know, new and upcoming songwriters, I'll say, write the songs that'll kill you inside if you don't let them out. You know what I mean? And I think, yeah, any kind of art form, I think whenever it's honest, even if it's, you're a basketball player and you're just pouring out honestly and sincerely, I think those things show, you know what I mean? When someone's humble, kind, and, and they just, they're doing it for the passion and the love of the craft, you know what I mean? That stuff shines through and I, that's, no matter what it is, I, I appreciate it. Yeah, and even if the listener isn't like an expert or familiar with the topic, just the, the passion and, the, and, the, and the, the emotion that comes through and the real sharing of authentic experience, that really helps the connection between the storyteller and the listener, don't you think? Absolutely, and I think honesty is healing in a lot of ways, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Honesty is so great. Um, as you're developing your own artistry, who or what were some of your artistic influences? Bob Marley is like all time. He, you know, he usually stays in that corner right there. I was, I'll switch those up every so often, but it's usually Bob Marley. Um, Michael Jackson is one of my favorite. I know it's, he's super controversial, but the, what he created is, you know, it's timeless. And I think there, there was a vulnerability and honesty in a lot of his music. Um, Tupac, another one. Um, I like people who, who created music that cared about humanity and cared about the state of, 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 of our existence. You know what I mean? Um, so those things, Bill Withers is another one. Sade, love Sade. Um, Nina Simone, I saw Nina Simone. I think that's Nina Simone. Oh uh, yeah, I, I won't call it a Nina Simone phase, but I went through a phase <laughs> of like only Nina Simone and she's just, she's incredible. So I think people just like, just who just are not afraid to pour out. You know what I mean? Those are the ones that really have, have uh, touched me in a deep way, so. 
Uh, yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, that's art that really matters because it, it reaches people and, and can help influence how they feel and behave and, and experience life and, and even, even how they can change the world, which is amazing. So um, your work touches on some very deep subject matter and your songs leave people with a lot to think about, but there's always this thread of hope. Where do you draw your inspiration and your ideas for your work? Uh, first and foremost from God, obviously, like for me, my faith is a big part of my life. But then I, I, I write songs that were for me first. You know what I mean? Like I've, I've gone through, I've traveled a lot in this world. Like I've backpacked across Ethiopia, backpacked across the Caribbean, about, across Ontario, Canada. And, you know, what they call soul searching. A lot of people thought I had like, they thought I lost my mind. <laughs> I, I didn't, you know what I mean? I just had some very deep, profound questions. And, um, but I felt like, you know, an outsider in the world. So I, I started writing songs like Bob Marley was, there was a period of time when Bob Marley was the only artist that made me feel like I can carry on with life, that I can just go on and move on. And I said, look, what music today is doing that for me? Who's a contemporary artist doing that? And at the time I couldn't think of anybody, for me at least. And I said, you know, if nobody's doing it, I'm gonna do it myself. And so music is like cathartic, it's healing for me. And I write the songs for me first. And I realize that if you are writing that honest, pure stuff, somebody else out there is going to connect to it. Somebody else is going to, because we're all living this life for the first time. You know, we're all humans. We all have the same makeup pretty much. Um, so if you feel something, there might be somebody out there who feels it. So just write it and, and put it out there, right? That is so valuable. And you're doing like what Mahatma Gandhi said, you're being the change you wanted to see in the world. Right. So kudos to you. Thank you. Thank you. The song you're going to perform for us today, We Want Enough. I love that title. It's a sentiment common to all humanity. It's not we want more, we want less. No, we want just the basics. We want to be able to live. Mm -hmm. How did you come to write this song? What was the inspiration for this song? Uh, <laughs> I, was, I was watching probably a lot of... Uh, it's Edward Snowden videos. <laughs> so I, I became a huge fan of his. Um, he's a very, very intelligent guy. But I, I think just looking at the world, I don't like this is an older song. So I'm trying to figure out like, what exactly started it. But I think I was just looking at a lot of like, you know, this Edward Snowden. I was looking at like the idea of this like supercomputer they're building to like, you know, the cloud storage and it's how we're shaping the world and how like our, my parents at least and, you know, their parents they were the workers who, who allowed this corporate technological world to become a, a monster in a way. You know what I mean? Not to say it's their fault, but I'm saying we just, they went into the factories, they put the grind down and they did that. And now we've gotten to a point where we're just begging, like imagine it's 2021 and we're talking about increasing minimum wage so that people can have livable wages. You know what I mean? So you have the Jeff Bezos, the Elon Musk of the world, and they want to just go to the moon which is which is great sure let's go to the moon but some of us just want to have a home <laughs> you know what i mean some of us just want to have healthy food every day you know what i mean um the idea of just not all of us not having those bare necessities like they say in the jungle book i get that's a jungle book right bare necessities is is it's not necessary you know what i mean uh this may be controversial to say but like i just watched jeff bezos give a hundred million dollars to um, Van, um, Van Jones for to go give to charity. Awesome, beautiful, great. But then you have all your staff members still working at a low wage and still, you know, like, why can't we just take that $100 million and pay people more money? You know what I mean? Um, it's a very convoluted, backed up system. The way we do things is very bureaucratic. And it's just like, we're not asking for everything. Like not all of us want to be billionaires. I don't want to be a billionaire. You know what I mean? But if you share some of that billions, we might all be able to be millionaires. You know what I mean? So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a socialist mentality. I'm a Canadian, so I'm not afraid of socialism. <laughs> um, but it's not, it's not socialism to me. It's just, it's just humanity. It's just, it's just compassion. You know what I mean? It's just responsibility. You know what I mean? So that's how I look at it. We want enough. We don't want it all. We just want enough, right? Yeah, I, I totally believe in that value of social responsibility. Like we're, we should be here for each other. We should lift each other up and, and support each, our, each other as a community. Uh, but your song, We Want Enough, really imbues that spirit so deeply and powerfully. And we, I love to hear it. Can you please play your song for us? Absolutely, yeah. Let's get this. Whoa! Sure. 
children gather around If they ask us why we're here, we'll shut them down We got answers, but not the means Cause all our dreams were sold to birth this cold machine And we can't turn it off We got it hard, but we got it rough And we ain't asking much We don't want it all We just want to know Oh, we want to know Trying to spin a future from this junk And you can't stop it now No, cause we're products of What you've begun No, we ain't asking much, no We don't want it all We just want to know Oh, we want to know dreams and what's the cost we're buying time go single file how we out of line we're on the brink we're on the cusp we don't want it all we just want to know Wow, I, God, what an amazing song. I was so deeply moved by your vocals and by the meaning in, this, in the story that you told there. And I don't just want enough. I want more of that song. I want to hear more of your music. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, you were channeling Marvin Gaye and Bob Marley and, and Bill Withers. I mean, uh, and, and of course, yourself, you know, your amazing talent in that, in that song. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, I hope you'll join us again on Brainwave sometime and feel free to listen in for the rest of the conversation if you'd like. Awesome. Take care. Joining me now to discuss youth mental health and wellness in underserved communities, Dr. Charmaine Jackman is the founder and CEO of InnoPsych Incorporated. His mission is to bring healing to, to communities of color by changing the face of mental health therapy. Isha Yelamanchali is a Bank of America student leader and youth mental health advocate. She's also a board member of HEART, helping every at-risk team. Viewers, feel free to post questions for our guests at any time during this webcast in the comment section. And thank you, thanks again for watching. Isha and Charmaine, thanks so much for joining us on Brainwaves today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, it's an honor to have you on the show. So um, Charmaine, can we start with you? Of course. Awesome. So social determinants play a crucial role in the health and well-being of individuals. In fact, I think it's the statistic is about 80% of the health of individuals is influenced by social determinants, things like economic factors in life and, and e e educational opportunities and living conditions and such. Mm -hmm. And inequities can be the difference between life and death as, we see, as we've seen during the pandemic. What kind of mental health toll does the stress from financial adversity take on young people in underserved communities? Yeah, and we had an um, excellent, excellent example with 
the COVID pandemic. But um, I think what was left off of my bio was that I've worked in a, in a high school in the Boston era for the last 17 years. So I am upfront and, and, and center with these issues affecting, affecting my students. So I would say, I mean, as you mentioned, right, the social determinants for students, it, sometimes they, it's a choice between going to school and going to work to support their family. Um, it's a, a, a choice between, or not necessarily a choice, but having access to, to food consistently, having access to meals beyond what you get at school, um, and then housing stability, right? So all of those things can impact your mental health, your um, depression, anxiety, because, right, if you think about if you're food insecure, if your housing is in, unstable or insecure as, as it is, then it's going to be really hard for you to come into class and sit down and, and, and learn. So people experience anxiety, depression, um, and if those go untreated because you have low access to quality, high quality care, mental health care and health care, then it might mean that you're on a long waiting list for therapists because therapists in private practice often don't take the state insurance because their reimbursement rates are lower. So it just gets compounded from one thing to the other. Um, if the economic um, conditions of the school district also are impacted, then that means schools may not have access to mental health resources at school, right? Where, you know, I was in a school where we did have myself and other social workers who were available um, for students. And I know students appreciated that access that they could just walk up the stairs, walk down the hall and talk to a counselor. But if you don't have counselors in the school, that means you don't have access to those services. You don't have someone who can help support you to connect you with resources in, in the community. So it just takes a, individually for the student, yes, but there are also systemic issues that also can impact the, the how that mental health condition may unfold um, and impact the trajectory of that student and their family. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the pandemic seems to have compounded that in that so many students were not going to school and, and couldn't access those services and, and the economic supports and that were part of the services there as well as the mental health supports, you know, so uh, students at home wouldn't have access to that at all if they couldn't get it through some other therapist or something. So um, yeah, yeah very, great, great points you made. And, you know, economic hardship impacts all aspects of life and often leads to tough decisions, as you said, mm -hmm. between um, saying getting an education and meeting basic daily needs. What are some ways to help alleviate the economic burden and mitigate the negative effects of a scarcity mindset that may come from such burden? <sighs> right now. I wish I was here. I mean, he talked about it in that intro that you did with him, right? So how do we think about access to resources from a systems level, not just from an individual level, right? Because we have districts, school districts or communities that have the resources that they need to be successful, then the students that live in those communities will have what they need. But if resources aren't distributed in an equitable manner, then we're always gonna have a group of people who don't have what they need for basic living, right? Just when we're talking basic needs, right? Um, so I think that's the impact. So that is like, how do you ensure that, that communities who have historically been disadvantaged and under-resourced get the resources that they need? I think that that's, that's key. We, you know, those, those seem to be, be easy answers, but it's like when we live in, a, as, as I was talking about, a socialist versus a capitalist environment, then those, you know, they're not looking at it through that lens. Yeah, that's true. You know, I recently read about a study uh, that took place in Kenya where the intervention was to help uh, families by giving them um, a uh, like a cash uh, stipend as opposed to giving them mental health therapy. It was actually those were the two interventions that were tested against each other, and then they tested the mental health effects of those two things. And it was found that the the um, the financial support was more effective at helping their mental health and their life outcomes than the mental health therapy was uh, for that for that particular population at that time. Um, so it, it just speaks to the social determinants factor and making sure people have the resources they need. Um, that could be the, the most effective thing to help people's mental health and ultimate well-being. Right. Yeah. And, I, you know, I think that um, I've heard similar studies, right, that, you know, give people the money so they can decide 
what how they want to use the money for. And it is hard if you if you don't have access to reliable le electricity or food, then therapy does is not a prior is not seen as a priority, right? And it can't be if you if you can, if you don't have three meals, right? If you're hungry, like that's always going to come as a second, um, uh, you know, not prioritized in that list. But then given small amounts of money, like what's the sustainability of that model too, right? So Yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, and Isha, um, you know, speaking of helping out communities and building resources in communities, you are one of Bank of America's student leaders. This is a program that recruits community-minded students from diverse backgrounds to help with economic mobility through youth employment. What has your experience been like in Minneapolis where you live? Well, first, I want to say thank you so much for having me on the show. And my experience, ha I have to say, has been incredibly positive here. As student leaders, we're all paired with nonprofits where we intern for the summer. The Minneapolis leaders are all interning with the Hennepin Theater Trust, which runs three historic theaters in the Minneapolis area, as well as does numerous other community projects that has to do with public art, education, and various different issues that the Minneapolis community has. Right now, I'm interning with the development department, which has to do with donor engagement and fundraising. And throughout my time, I've just found it incredibly rewarding to be able to work on these projects that have helped aid community development and to see my work firsthand being productive in the community sphere. For example, I help sort donations for the Spotlight Education Campaign, which helps support Minnesota's high school musical theater students and helps give meaningful arts education to youth. And even though it was one of the smallest, it's such a small task, I just felt so connected to my community to see my work being a part of the amazing things they do and helping the nonprofit with all of their, all of the things they do. And I just thought that was so rewarding. And just the other day, we actually took a tour around the theater district area to see all the projects that the trust is working on. It's just amazing to see how this organization is able to engage and benefit the local community, especially since Minneapolis has such high homelessness rates, which is devastating for all of us to see, but it's such an important thing that we need to talk about. And the fact that this organization is working so hard to create better spaces and more livable spaces in this area, I just find so amazing. One project we got to witness firsthand is called It's the People, which is a series of these photo banners on the sides of buildings that highlight community members and specific issues that Minneapolis faces, like violence against Native American women, racism, and discrimination against the LGBTQ community. These pictures shed so much light on sometimes overlooked communities and problems, which I think is incredibly important in this day and age to look at because it poses so many questions on where funding is going, where it should be going, and all of the effects that having that money can do for those kinds of communities. And another project they work on is called Five to 10, which in a normal non-pandemic year is basically a weekly community party almost that's targeting homeless youth and vulnerable population where there's free food, live performances, activities, security, access to mental health resources, access to educational resources. And it just makes, and the event is in such a safe space because the security there is from the community. And I just love to see how my work was aiding this development and making so many people's and underserved communities lives so much better. And I just thought that was incredibly rewarding. It, sound, it does sound extremely rewarding. Uh, congratulations for all the good that you've been a part of having come to fruition. I mean, that's amazing to hear about all those programs helping educate youth about art, help, helping them make art, helping those, helping homeless youth come together in a, in a community space where they can learn about opportunities and perhaps access opportunities for mental health care or for education or, um, or perhaps even job placement. Um, but that, you know, it's amazing that you do all these wonderful things through your student leadership program. So absolutely hats off to you. And I imagine you're, you're good at the development aspect of things because you're extremely passionate and articulate in how you express um, the benefits of, of these programs to the people who access them. Thank yeah. you so much. You're welcome. So uh, how does this practical experience not only benefit student leaders such as yourself, but also help their communities at large? You know, you, you've gone into that. Um, but you know, in terms of once, once you're done with the program, you know, how do you think this will influence your career going forward and other student leaders going forward? 
Well, first off, this experience has taught me so much about the nonprofit industry in general because that's not really covered in schools. Everything's like everyone's been saying, everyone has that kind of capitalist mentality and they're like, you should go to the larger corporations, but learning about the nonprofit industry and how they function, what they provide in the community has just shown me what a successful nonprofit can do for the world and the importance they have and sometimes are not considered for a lot of different people. And it just, it makes me so happy to learn about that and maybe, and pushes me towards those kinds of careers. And the student leader program is also amazing because last week we actually hosted a virtual summit in which me and the other 300 student leaders around the country had a chance to meet and interact with one another, which was so amazing. During this week, we had the opportunity to meet with influential people in the world and how, and learn about how they shaped our communities. And we got the chance to meet with Wade Henderson, who is a prominent civil rights leader, congressional representatives, economic professors, and even documentary filmmakers, all of whom had made such an impact in the world in monumental ways, but very different ways, I have to say. And it just gave me this, um, like an immense wealth of knowledge and connections and tools that are gonna just stay with all of us throughout our life. And beyond that, my time like working in the summit and with our nonprofit has pushed me more than I already was to pursue a career in social justice. And then we got to meet with former student leaders who are in college right now. And from their experience, they tell us what this program has done for them. And it shows how they were given the tools to be leaders in their communities and be that change that you're making. Like one person we got to meet has started his own reusable water company that hel is helping with the water crisis in Africa. And he's only a junior in college. And it's an incredible thing. And he talks about how this program gave him the tools to be able to do that in his future. And I think that's what it's doing for me as well. And I'm really excited to see what I'm going to be able to do after this. <laughs> I am just floored by the power of this program as you described it. I mean, wow, how inspiring that summit must have been and the exposure to all these you know, amazing people doing good for the world and, and showing that you can make an impact and, and you know, they're living proof that you can and, and those people do. You know? So um, I, I wish you an amazing career ahead. I'm sure you will do great things for everyone. Thank you. Yeah. And Charmaine, how can opportunities like these to gain valuable skills and help their communities impact the mental well-being of young people? Thank you, Aisha, for sharing your stories and the work that you're doing and the stories of your, your peers. I think it's just wonderful and amazing. And I think it's like, it's we uh, as a community or society always have to remember that our young people have powerful voices and excellent ideas about how to solve some of the things that we don't know how to solve, right? And so I think a program like this is really tapping into that knowledge and providing exposure to opportunities that they may not have had access to. And then they can use that information to help them think about, okay, how, how can I help my community? And I think one of the things that you've also highlighted is that how do we look at our communities not only as deficits, but where, where are the, the assets in our communities? And then how do we help students build on those? How do we help students go back and find the resources and the assets that are in their communities and elevate those? Um, I think one of the things that I really connected um, to what you were sharing, Isha, was that you know, having these programs really helped you to go back and see what are some things within your communities that you can help to elevate and highlight. And I think that's really a, a powerful message from this program. Fantastic. And I, I imagine it, you know, Isha, it, it, um, by giving you this inspiration and this, this like drive to achieve great things for uh, the community, um, it, it must give you a sense of purpose and a stability and like a, um, help you, you know, stay motivated to keep on going forward, which must be good for your mental well being. don't do you think? I definitely think it is. I think that having programs like this where you get to interact with your peers who are also pa so passionate and so knowledgeable in their in their differences and highlighting those differences and learning from those differences is so useful and so helpful to put things into effect in your own communities. And I like one of the things that we get to do is a group project, the four student leader, leaders from Minneapolis. And we got so many ideas for what we want to change in our community by talking to other student leaders, by looking at these speakers and seeing what they've done and their ideas. And it's, it really shows you 
and it really changes your mindset and your ability to think about what you can do I think and it just I think it's really motivational in that kind of way and really it really shows that you're able to be part of the change because I think a lot of the time discouragement takes away from the good that so many people can do but when people are encouraged and have these opportunities the change that they can do in their communities is unstoppable. And I think that's what's so great about this program. And I love having the opportunity to be a part of it and talk about it. That's amazing. Thank you, Isha, for t- telling us about this amazing program and the power it has. Um, so we're talking about youth mental health in underserved communities with Isha Yelamanchili, who is a Bank of America student leader and youth mental health advocate and Dr. Charmaine Jackman, the founder and CEO of InnoPsych Incorporated. And viewers, don't forget, if you have questions or comments for our, our guests or um, at any time, feel free to post them in the comment section of this webcast. And if the, what you're learning today from our guests today is, uh, is interesting and fascinating, like I think it is as well, um, and you think someone else could benefit from it, please share this webcast with your friends and family. So, Back to you, Charmaine. Uh, July is BIPOC Mental Health Month. You started InnoPsych to increase mental health access for people of color. And it is an innovation born for your own personal experiences and frustrations. Mm-hmm. Tell us about your experience and why this resource for people of color was, is, was and is so needed in the mental health space. Yeah, thank you for that. And just to just explain what BIPOC is, some, some people aren't familiar with it. It's a newer term, um, refers to Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And yeah, so my own personal experience, as I said, I um, have worked in the field for over 23 years and I'm very passionate about the people that I work with. I've mostly worked in communities of color at schools and juvenile courts and hospitals and community-based settings. So it's always something that I've been passionate about for a long time. But a few years ago, I was going through a challenging time in my life and I was looking for a therapist and I wanted a a black woman therapist. I was clear about who I wanted to sit across the couch from. Um, And it was really challenging. Um, And the process was extremely overwhelming. And I'm like, I'm a therapist and I'm having such such trouble. When when you think about our communities and and why I focus on communities of color, and I get that question a bit, there's a lot of stigma around mental health and therapy. Um, We have a lot of cultural messages which say, this is not for us, it's a luxury, this is for other people, this is for white people, right? And we don't believe that we can benefit from the process. And granted, you know, it was not made with us in mind when it started, but I'm of the ideas that we can make it work for us. And we do have therapists who are making it work for us. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to make sure that like when you are at a challenging time in your life and you have pushed through the stigma about getting mental health and you've said, I wanna go meet with a therapist and then it can take over six months. Someone shared with me in a chat, it took her eight years like that is just not okay. Um, and we want people to be able to, to, to find a therapist, to use a resource and to find value from it. And so I was just very, very uh, moved by my own experience and the experience that other people had shared with me prior to that about their struggle finding a therapist. But I didn't really believe it till I, had a, I went through it myself. And I just, I just, I was really, um, again, really frustrated with that process. And I'm like, I can't, I can't be in the field, sit behind the couch and, and know that that's happening for people. So that was my motivation. It's about wanting to find someone who's culturally competent and empathetic. Yes, absolutely. Right. And people ask that a lot, like, why does it matter? It matters that I can go into a space with someone who might be Bajan or maybe not, but who've had a similar historic experience in this country. And I don't have to explain certain things. Like there's some things that are given. And it doesn't mean that we, ha- we are monolithic or we have identical experiences, but there's some things you just don't need to say or you don't have to explain. And so that was really the motivation about really ensuring that people have a choice, right? We collect data, actually, we have a survey where we ask people, is it important for you to have a therapist of color? And 90% of people say it's, it's important. Um, 80% of those people say it's very important. So it's not important for everyone, but people really want the choice. And I think that's what we're really trying to offer that if that's something that you want, let's help you get that. 
Absolutely. That's amazing. And, um, you know, it's great. It's important to democratize mental health so that uh, everyone in the community can access it. Um, otherwise, uh, you, the, the racial inequities and economic inequities that frack our society are just uh, going to stay perpetuated and people won't have the wellness that they deserve. So amazing work you're doing. Thank you. Absolutely. Isha, uh, you are on the board of HEART, helping every at-risk teen. A big part of your work is reducing stigma. How do you help young people with your message about mental health? Well, for us, we try to make everything incredibly accessible to everyone in our school community. We focus a lot on Instagram and like circulate posts about mental health awareness and about the events that we host just so the resources out there because believe it or not, teenagers a lot of the time are on social media. So we do try to do that, that way a lot of the time. We also use things like our school newsletters and flyers around our school building to let everyone know about all the information and the resources we have. And then when that doesn't always get everyone excited, we go to them. So one of the activities we do is called Stand Against Stigma, where we actually go into our three middle schools in our school district to talk to eighth graders and those incoming freshmen about the transition into high school. We talk about mental health, how to deal with the stresses that come with aging, with having a new future, having to plan for your future and ways to cope when we face those obstacles that make us feel so alone in the world. So we try to give them as much access to the resources that may help them in the future. And by going to them, we've seen like a lot of positive change for them and a lot of positive feedback because otherwise, a lot of the times, not a lot of us want to go and find those resources until maybe it's a little bit too late. Mm -hmm. And then during the pandemic, because it's hard to go into those middle schools anywhere, we made a video to send to them instead that gave them all the same resources to keep the tradition alive about helping them. And then Wellness Week is actually one of our largest events of the year, and it's basically a whole week of mental health related events and activities before school, after school, and during the day. And so during it, we created this thing called the Heart Remind System. Basically, students could sign up with their phone numbers, and every few days, a message would pop into their phones with encouraging words or quotes that made us smile, just to make us feel connected with each other and that someone's on our side, which is so hard because I go to a school with around 3,500 plus students. So it's hard for everyone to feel like they're a part of that community. And we also try to bring in mental health speakers who have a lot of knowledge about mental health and who have overcome their own challenges to talk about their experience with us. And a lot of the time what we've seen is that our peers who are struggling with mental health issues feel so very alone in the world when they're not and we all want to be a part of the change that's going to help them and uplift them. They, it just sometimes those challenges just feel impossible to overcome. And by bringing these people and by hosting these open mics, we're trying to reduce the stigma around mental health and talking about mental health, just so that people are able to share their own stories and be heard and feel valued in our community because they are. And it just helps us put those mental health illnesses and those feelings into perspective and allows everyone to feel less alone, which is basically the entire point of our organization because we want everyone to be happy. We want everyone to be comfortable in their own skin and ready to take the world by storm. <laughs> it sounds incredibly powerful what you're doing with heart. And um, to what degree, I mean, you talked about, that's the point, you know, building community, helping people feel a part of something that, uh, of a community that values them for who they are and lets them feel comfortable with who they are and empowers them to be who they are. Um, so hats off to, to you, amazing what you're doing there. Um, so Charmaine, uh, and, you lead. Can I just add, I just want to yes. affirm the work that you're doing. I think it is so powerful to have peer mentors and peers leading this work. And I hope that you go on and be a psychologist sometime. So <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Charmaine's doing a little workforce development today. Yes, I am. <laughs> Always. <laughs> awesome. So Charmaine, uh, not, only, not only do you do workforce development, but you also lead workshops for corporations and other groups on various topics surrounding trauma, discrimination, and cultural sensitivity. When it comes to racial equity, how can companies be part of the solution? Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate that question. Um, and that's, that's also another question that I get quite a bit. I think that there are a number of things, right? It's first, it's recognizing that your employees have different needs. So 
one of the things that I've been doing as I have gotten more into this space is talking to EAPs and, and also HR departments. And one of the things I noticed pre-COVID, a lot of their employees of color were not using EAP services. We, I talked about the stigma earlier, right? So there's stigma around mental health. And then you add that in the workplace, it's even more of a barrier. So a lot of people hadn't used those services. And as a result, a lot of those networks were not really diverse. Now that people are, are really desperate to have men's access to mental health resources, they're actually tapping into those workplace um, resources. And what we find is a lot of those then, those, those resources in their workplaces aren't really meeting their needs, right? Um, you know, we, I encourage employees to not think of their employees as a one size fits all. Um, also thinking about, similar to the example that you talked about earlier around, do you give people money or do you give people something that you think they need, right? So what, what about having, for employees having access to resources within their communities? So they may want therapy, but they may wanna use their yoga center that's in their community, right? Or they may wanna do Tai Chi classes, right? So how are they thinking about um, wellness um, and mental health resources through those different lenses and asking their employees, actually, what is it that you want? What will help you? And I think that that's a key place to start that conversation is asking your employees what they want and not assuming that what you have is what they actually will take. Um, the other thing I think is really important is really making that distinction between wellness and mental health. Um, a lot of companies do the work around wellness, right? Physical wellness and access to finances, but they get really quiet around the mental health. I think part of it is because of that stigma. They don't, they don't wanna go there. I think it's really um, incumbent on, on organizations to really normalize that conversation about mental health and how different mental health conditions operate. If people are allowed to take mental health days as part of their sick days, right? So how are you being explicit about some of those policies? And then really thinking about the culture of the, the, the workplace, right? Are you creating systems and are you have structures that actually lead to burnout and just unsustainable um, work days and work weeks, right? So if your work culture and work environment is actually contributing to people's mental health conditions, then it's really important to, for companies to reflect on that and actually to be mindful of how the work, um, the work setting can actually impact mental health and worsen mental health conditions. Yeah, it's important to, for companies to be mindful and to understand what their employees need and, and what they want. Um, so right on. Thank you for explaining that. Um, so now it's time for the lightning round, a uh, very fun part of the show. Um, this is going to be five questions with quick answers, one person at a time. We'll start with you, Dr. Jackson, and then we'll go to next to you, Isha. Okay, ready? Okay, here we go, Charmaine. What helps you cope when you're going through a tough time mentally? Um, I love taking walks, just going outside, leaving my music, just taking in the natural sounds and sights of nature. Beautiful. And when you're feeling down, what song or type of music do you turn to? I have a whole playlist called Thriving Thursdays, and it's created from my own music, but people who I bring onto my show. Um, but I love Jill Scott, Bob Marley, Nina Simone. Um, I, I have a range, um, but I'm really open, but I'll go to my Thriving Thursdays playlist and, and play that. <laughs> you got great. You have your own personal and motivational playlist. Yeah, of course. Everyone should. <laughs> you bet. You bet. Um, speaking of which, did you find any books, films, or television uh, that particularly inspired you during the pandemic? Yeah, I found that uh, particularly with the racial reckoning and the racial violence, I really tapped into some old documentaries. And one that I found especially inspiring was one by um, Shirley Chisholm. Um, she is a black woman who has Barbadian heritage, which I'm, I'm Barbadian. Um, and she was the first black woman to um, get on the, the ticket for president of the United States. So her story is very inspiring. Absolutely. What is one thing you'd like to see change for the better as a result of the pandemic crisis? 
<laughs> you give me one thing, Brandon. <laughs> um, I think it's really about conversations about race um, in this country. And I think people are very nervous to have these conversations. And I think people just need to, it's, it's not, they're not going to be comfortable. Just go into it and do it. And let's just figure out how we can be equitable uh, in 2021. Let's do this. <laughs> let's do it. Absolutely. It won't be easy. We have to do this. Mm -hmm. What gives you hope? My kids I have two young kids, eight, eight and 10. Um, and all the work that I do is to make sure that I'm creating a world that's better for them. Mm, that's so great. Uh, well, thank you, Charmaine. Um, love your answers. Thank you. Yeah. Isha, it's your turn. You ready? I am. Okay. What helps you cope when you're going through a tough time mentally? For me, it's my incredible support system. My family, my friends, my heart community. They're always there supporting me, pushing me motivating me and if I'm ever in a mood where I'm sad they know and they talk to me about it they hold my hand through it I think having that community is what keeps me going all the time oh that's wonderful what and when you're feeling down what song or type of music do you turn to um I definitely turn to chiller music I do like indie pop thing like glass animals Lana Del Rey I just feel that slower melodies help calm and ground me and just put things into perspective for me a little bit. <laughs> Absolutely. Kind of meets you where you are and gets you perhaps into a better track. Um, did you find any books, films, or television that particularly inspired you during the pandemic? Yes, for sure. So during the pandemic, I started to read some of the more classic books. I thought to like educate myself a little bit. I read Pride and Prejudice, Little Women. I just found the themes moving and relatable, but just like a testament to how far we've come as a society in terms of like values. And in terms of television, I definitely used it as just a source of comfort for myself. Used watch sitcoms like New Girl, also watched old classics for the first time, like the entire Star Wars series. I don't know what I was doing. I was missing out on a lot. But then also to learn a little bit more, I was also watching those documentaries after the racial reckoning, especially because there was so much happening in Minneapolis at the time. The one I found the most moving was called 13th, which is on Netflix. It's amazing. And I learned so much watching it. Thank you. I'll we'll check that out. What is one thing you'd like to see change as a result of the pandemic crisis? Well, systemically, I'd really like to see a better distribution of resources in crisis situations, whether that be natural disasters or global pandemics in the future, specifically with communities of colors, which were so disproportionately affected by this pandemic. I just, I really feel like that's something that really needs to change. For sure. What gives you hope? Seeing communities come together and helping each other out to overcome those obstacles and issues that we face, like this global pandemic, as well as like finding creative ways to stay in contact, like while we're socially distant, just gives me a lot of hope in humanity and our re resilience and our ability to impact change. And you model that incredibly through your heart uh, organization. Um, so thanks for letting us know about that. Hopefully, hopefully more teens in your area will learn from this webcast and, and connect with you there. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Isha and Charmaine. And viewers, thank you too. Now, please stick around for a moment. Our team at One Mind Cyber Guide will profile an app called Smiling Mind that provides young people with tools to help them build thriving throughout their lives. Take it away, Cyber Guide team. Hi, I'm Kathy Chang, and I'm a research assistant at One Mind Cyber Guide. Mental health apps offer a lot of benefits and can be a great tool in your mental health toolkit. Apps are usually low cost and there are lots of free apps on the app stores. Apps can be used on the go. You can use them on your commute, at home, in school for even 5-10 to 10 minutes at a time. Having an app on your phone means that you can get care almost anywhere and anytime. They can be used quickly, discreetly, and anonymously at times when you need some extra support. When you use a mental health app, you don't have to grapple with making appointments, wait lists, or insurance. On top of that, lots of apps offer creative and fun ways to manage mental health, so you might have some fun when you use them. 
Importantly, there is also building evidence that these apps are effective in helping people manage mental health challenges. In some cases, they can be as effective as traditional treatments like therapy. Smiling Mind aims to help users achieve better mental health and balance through mindfulness and meditation. There is a lot of content for both adults and youth on the app. There are programs for teenagers and the unique challenges they face, as well as programs for kids under 12. There are a number of tracks aimed at helping people deal with stress in the classroom for both students and educators. Each session lasts anywhere from 1 to 10 minutes and can be completed at any time. Users can favorite their programs or sessions to find them easily later and set notifications to remind them to meditate. Users can also download tracks while they are connected to the internet, which they can access later, even if they are offline. We've reviewed Smiling Mind at One Mind Cyber Guide, and it receives a score of 4.67 out of 5 on credibility and a score of 4.84 out of 5 on user experience. Join us again next week for another app review and visit OneMindCyberGuide.org to learn more about mental health apps. Thanks, CyberGuide team, and thanks also to I, Isha, and Charmaine, Dr. Charmaine Jackman. Viewers, thank you too. Don't forget, you can post questions and find all of our back episodes at onemind.org slash brainwaves, where you can also sign up for our newsletter to stay updated on brainwaves and everything else One Mind does. Bye, everyone. Thank you, and have a great day. My mother has had depression uh, most of her life. My uncle committed suicide when he was in his 30s. I live with bipolar. Now, more than ever, it's the world's leading cause of disability. Yet research to improve mental health lacks the attention physical health research receives. Visit OneMind.org. From the lab to the front lines, accelerating brain health for all. Help us fund new treatments at OneMind.org.